Get Rich Education is brought to you by Valhalla Wealth and Ridge Lending Group. You're listening to the show that has created more passive income for people than nearly any show in the world. This is the powerful Get Rich Education. Welcome in. This is GRE, Get Rich Education, episode 169. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. It is a new year, and we've got a lot for you to think about today. We're going to discuss your selection of real estate investing geographic markets. We're going to talk about what you should look for in a property manager. And finally, we're going to talk to a longtime Get Rich Education listener. Yes, someone just like you and get his thoughts and perspective on what he's learned from this very show and how he's putting it into action. Now, a great study's findings were recently released, and it aggregated data from both HUD and Zillow, and it ranked the metro areas that have the best ratio of rent income to purchase price. And, oh, I can't wait to share this with you. This ratio of rent income to purchase price is the top determinant toward your passive income stream We give some general updates here on appreciation from time to time with some measure like the Case-Shiller Index, but this update here on the top metros for the highest ratio of rent income to purchase price is what really matters most to cash flow centric real estate investors. And importantly, this index is only selecting among the 50 most populous U.S. metro markets. And the fifth best national RV ratio and well, not so much national again, but within the top 50 metros for the year, number five, the fifth best is in Kansas City, Missouri. The fourth best one on the list is in Indianapolis, Indiana. And before we go on with the next ones on the list here for the latest year ended, again, we're talking about the rent to price ratio, also known as the rent to value ratio, because the ratio of your rent income to purchase price is that number one metric to predicting monthly income for you. And by the way, the next biggest variables after that, the rent and the price, they are your mortgage interest rate and your property tax obligation, okay? And we want to look at this because rent to value ratio is more sustainable and it's more predictable than appreciation is. This is a measure of your income, your cash flow. If we were to instead look at the markets that experienced appreciation in the last year, well, that's more speculative and appreciation jumps around a lot more than your projected income here than with this rent to value ratio. So coming in at number three is Birmingham, Alabama. So yeah, so far, these three cities on the list, Kansas City, Indy, and Birmingham, they're cities where we've had turnkey providers appear here on the show. Number two on the list, it is in Detroit, Michigan, and the number one metro on the list, and by a pretty wide margin above number two on the list, and it probably comes to you as no surprise at all, I'm sure, because it is, once again, the king of cash flow, that non-flashy market, that metro that Forbes has actually ranked as the number one cap rate market in the world. In fact, in that is in, yes, Memphis, Tennessee. And we've talked at length about why Memphis is number one for cash flow. It's a transportation hub that keeps the cost of labor and shipping and doing business low, but it sort of keeps a floor on sustainable labor. So that helps bolster rents proportionally to the low purchase price of property there. So right there, four out of the top five profitable cash flow markets are ones that we feature here at Get Rich Education, every one of the five except Detroit. So again, that's Memphis, Birmingham, Indy, and Kansas City. And St. Louis is also in the top 10. And all of those places mentioned are markets where you can connect with those metros providers at greturnkey.com. You know, you can either teach a man to fish or give a man a fish. And a while ago, I thought, Well, why not do both? Both is the abundance mentality, right? So here at GetRichEducation.com, we teach you how to fish. And GREturnkey.com is where we also give you a fish where you can connect with the best providers in the best U.S. cash flowing real estate markets. 
and actually grab some property for yourself. You know, a lot of media people, they don't understand what really matters to real estate investors, especially cash flow centric ones, because so much of the media is consumed with stock and CNBC and mutual fund and capital gains type of investors. Have you ever seen any of these articles? I've seen them, although not lately, fortunately, where you'll see an article that says, for example, hey, apartments in Manhattan rent for $3,500 a month. So those landlords are really raking it in. And I'm just making up that $3,500 number, by the way, but that's what they say. Oh, that's a high rent amount. So those landlords are really making out well. And then by comparison, look at Kansas City, because that's where landlords are only getting $1,100 a month for a rental single family home. So you really don't want to be a landlord in Kansas City then. Well, geez, that is so oversimplified and 100% wrong. That's actually pretty much upside down from the truth. That says nothing about the purchase price or property value relative to the rent income that you generate. And of course, it also says nothing about the Landlord Tenant Act in that state or that New York has rent control or on and on. But I mean, geez, how could it get much worse? Maybe it could get worse than oversimplifying that, maybe by saying that the Manhattan landlord has really got it made because he also has his property nearly paid off. So gosh, reading articles like that just really fires me up. I know you might have read some of those in the past. Oh, geez, a higher rent amount doesn't mean that it's better for an income property owner. It's just not that simple. Well, hey, how's your relationship going with your property managers? That's a key question to ask yourself because if that's going well, it's more likely that your properties are performing well. Property management is a tough job. As I like to say, property management ought to be called tenant management and dealing with tenants can make you lose faith in humanity. I managed for five and a half years myself. That was a mistake. It's time I'll never get back. As I've told you, I would have learned all the lessons that I needed to learn in one to two years. And, you know, maybe your property manager is going to respond more slowly to a building's concerns than you would, or maybe they'll respond faster than you could, especially if you've got a day job. But they are professionals. They've got systems. They know that local landlord and tenant act. They're going to be more efficient for you in the long run. Your best and highest use is as the asset manager of your properties in various markets, and you are presiding over the various managers in each metro. Your job ultimately is not to manage property, but to take your time to go out and find another property to buy or learn about tax reduction across your entire portfolio in one fell swoop or have a vacation and actually enjoy yourself. That's why we're doing all this stuff. So when you've employed professional management, see, they get cost savings on bulk materials like granite or solid surface countertops and flooring and paint, and you would not get that. Say you've got a professional manager that takes care of four of your properties, okay? You've got four of your properties out there. A professional manager is taking care of them. And see, that manager has a total management portfolio of 500 properties, four of yours and 496 that belong to others. Okay, well now, when your manager summons a plumber about a problem that's at your properties, not only do you not have to be involved, but think about how quickly that plumber is going to respond. Because when your manager has 500 total units that they manage, well, that's a substantial book of business to that plumbing company, and they're going to respond quickly and treat that management's request well and probably quite a bit better, and they're going to prioritize that higher than if you were self-managing and trying to get the plumber to respond to you in only your four rental units. So now that you've leveraged the manager, that's just one way that you use their economies of scale. You leverage their economies of scale to your advantage. And now a plumber doesn't just look at you as you. They often don't even know you. The front face to them is that property manager, which is a substantial book of business for that plumber. So they're going to serve that manager's clients well. And due to the volume, they might have also negotiated a lower rate there between the manager and the plumber, and that may or may not trickle onto you. How is your property manager marketing your units? Do you have any idea? Are they marketing them more to millennials 
or baby boomers or somewhere in between. Just think about if they're marketing your place with Instagram versus putting large banners on a building when they're advertising your vacancy. So you've got to think about what type of tenant each method is going to attract. How about pets? Do you want to attract pets to your unit? A certain type of advertising and management and product type is going to affect that. Now, you might think that you don't want pets in your unit, but if you've got a substantial pet park near your properties, well, that's going to be so attractive to pet owners that you might get higher occupancy and more rent income if your manager markets your places toward pet owners. And, you know, think about it. Now that LVP, luxury vinyl plank, has become the flooring type of choice rather than carpets, well, that holds up better to pets. And I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like nearly everyone has a pet today versus just a few years ago. And if you have property in a concrete jungle, well, just think about it. That might not be appealing to pet owners. So, yes, that's right. We discuss both the macro and the micro picture here at Get Rich Education. Real estate spans the gamut from grandma yelling, hiking interest rates at the Fed to thinking about how you'll handle pets in your Jacksonville income property. So, again, think about how your tenant is thinking. So many of them have pets. The demographic of the American renter has changed quite substantially in just the last 10 years. Historically, renters have been young and single, and historically, renters have had low to middle incomes and typically less education than their homeowning counterparts. Besides more people overall now renting rather than owning, which has led to where today we have the lowest homeownership rate in generations like I've discussed before, some people are asking the question, now, when did renters get so old? When, why did they get so old? There are some interesting numbers out there from the Census Bureau. It shows that between 2009 and 2015, the number of renters aged 55 and over, it exploded 28% in that period, just that short, recent six-year period. But renters under age 35, they grew by a little bit more than a tenth of that rate, just a meager 3%. So that's nearly 2.5 million new rental households just among the over 55 crowd. And this can be a very good thing for you as older renters are more stable and older renters tend to know what they want and what they don't want. And older renters tend to move less often, therefore, than younger renters do. You cannot age discriminate out there when your manager is selecting your tenant, but this is just the overall demographic trend here. And there's new data that shows that renters are also becoming better educated than they were just 10 years ago. Now, as a society overall, you got to remember that we're better educated than we were 10 years ago. But even discounting for that fact, the typical renter is becoming better educated faster than the general population is just another positive for us as income property owners. Another trend is the rental surge in single family homes. Yes, a surge in demand for single family rental homes versus other rental product types. The Urban Land Institute recently let us know that of the 44 million rental units in the United States, okay, 44 million total rental units in the United States, that single family rentals now make up 35% of them, and that's up from 31% 10 years ago. So just to sort of recap here, compared to before, American renters are older, American renters are higher income, and they're better educated, and more of these renters are occupying and demanding single family homes. Low inventory, though, is one challenge for investors like us, for sure. Housing inventory for sale across the United States, that continues to hover here at 20-year lows. It's at about 4.2 months of supply right now, and that's averaged across the U.S., so that includes many slower, low-demand regions. And then around popular urban areas with plenty of jobs, inventory is even more scarce than that paltry 4.2 months supply. But see, even that shallow inventory, that's not nearly meeting buyer's demand because new construction of homes, that heavily favors luxury homes because of their higher margins for contractors. So this is creating an enormous shortage of starter homes 
And those starter homes are often the ones that make the best turnkey rentals. Still, it's not just about low supply and higher home prices. Fewer Americans even want to buy a home because many were burnt so badly during the housing crisis, or they saw their parents get burned so badly that they no longer even consider owning a home as part of the American dream. A lot of people still want to own a home that can't, but there are just fewer of those people than before. And, you know, hey, maybe these older adults that are increasingly renting are kind of on to something. Who really wants to stress about home maintenance or burning the weekends at Lowe's at Home Depot or landscaping in retirement? Maybe they've decided that outsourcing home care and repairs and maintenance is worth paying a certain premium for. I know a lot of people personally that increasingly feel that way. So, If renting used to be seen as sort of this bane of or this place of financial suffering for young people and lower income people before they could afford to buy a home, well, renting has now become a longer term lifestyle choice. In fact, I might talk about this on a future show. I almost, almost regret being a homeowner myself right now. If I could sell my home to a buyer but keep living in it for as long as I want to, therefore, What I'd really do is I would stop making a mortgage payment and start making a rent payment instead. So I'd be doing like a sale lease back from the owner that I just sold my home to. I would actually consider doing that. I know that's counterintuitive, but I would do that because it's less expensive than renting when you break down all the costs. And I'm not going to go into all that today. I wrote a popular article on that that you can read a while. You can find it at getricheducation.com slash blog if you're so interested. But basically, your best success formula with real estate is to be a renter yourself in a high cost property, but be an income property owner yourself of many of many of these low cost homes in the Midwest and South. But anyway, with those changing renter demographics that I've been discussing, see, there's a specific intentional reason why we focus on providing others with rental housing for investment on this show. It's because the demographics support it and the demographics look great for perhaps another decade or maybe even longer. And if you fear that interest rates are going to rise, well, you can lock in 30 years of fixed interest rate debt certainty with one to four unit properties. And you can't very well do that with larger apartment buildings. So Every once in a while, you've got to look at conditions and economic indicators that are out there and make sure that you're still doing the right thing. And gosh, just for all of those reasons above, we squarely are. Well, hey, a few weeks from now, I'll be traveling from my hometown of Anchorage and making a long flight to Florida. I'll be doing a little real estate tour of Florida, Orlando and Jacksonville for sure, maybe Tampa Bay as well. It's because the numbers for real estate investors work in those Florida markets, and they work in a lot of Florida markets, as long as you're substantially north of Miami, where the numbers don't work. Maybe you don't have the time and inclination to travel like I do, or you wish that you had access to the same knowledge and the same properties that I do. Well, you do. And the exciting thing is that both our Orlando and Jacksonville providers have available inventory at last check. And you can connect with those same providers at greturnkey.com. Well, you know how I like to have Get Rich Education listeners like you on the show sometimes. I consider today's guest someone who's become somewhat of a friend of mine. This is a young Get Rich Education listener. He reached out to me last year. And then later we met in person at a media event in Anaheim, California. I was traveling to this media event thinking that two of my friends were going to be coming along with me, but then they couldn't make it. So I kind of ended up palling around at the event with our next guest. We'll get the perspective of a fellow listener just like you. Since 2014, the powerful Get Rich Education podcast has created more passive income for people than nearly any other show in the world. This show teaches you how to earn strong returns from passive real estate investing in the best markets without losing your time being a flipper or landlord. Show host Keith Weinhold writes for both Forbes and Rich Dad Advisors and delivers a new show every week. Since 2014, there's been millions of listener downloads in 188 world nations. He has A-list show guests and top-selling personal finance author, Robert Kiyosaki. Get Rich Education can be heard on every podcast platform, plus it has its own dedicated Apple and Android listener phone apps. Build wealth on the go with the Get Rich Education podcast. Sign up now for the Get Rich Education podcast or visit GetRichEducation.com. 
Cashflow real estate investors, if you're looking for a mortgage loan with a company that specializes in investment property loans, it's Ridge Lending Group. They provide income property loans in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of investors and homeowners all over the country. In fact, with ethics and transparency, they've helped more people realize their dreams through real estate investing than any other mortgage lender in the country. Get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. MC Laubscher is the host of the top-rated business and investing podcast, Cashflow Ninja, and also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth. They help busy people build wealth outside of Wall Street by strategically combining their clients' cash flow statements with the financial vehicle of the wealthy, according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested to learn how to perpetually multiply your wealth, you can access an exclusive webinar at your own banking system. Com. This is our Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, Robert Kiyosaki. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Well, I'd like to welcome on to the show a longtime Get Rich Education listener, and he's since turned the corner and he's become somewhat of an educator himself. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Jacob Ayers. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having me. Hey, share a bit of your background with us. Hey, okay. Well, Keith, uh, my name is Jacob Ayers, uh, like you just mentioned, and I'm from a small town in western Oklahoma. And like many of your listeners out there, I'm sure, Keith, I was born and raised with this blueprint, and that was to go to school and get a good education so that you can go to a university or college and further that education and eventually get a day job. And while I did all those things, Keith, and I found myself in my mid-20s with this day job, I realized that that blueprint only got me to my mid 20s and I was left looking for what was next. You know, it was kind of at the end of my roadmap. And that's where I kind of found real estate investing and it kind of took off from there. Yeah. So there are a lot of interesting things there, Jacob. You realize that, yeah, in order to do different and have different, you need to start thinking differently. And uh, I know that you shared with me one of the first times we ever met, really the first podcast that you ever listened to was Get Rich Education. So just tell us about how you found it and how you went from there. Yeah, funny enough, Keith, it was a think in 2014, and I had never heard of a podcast before. And somebody had mentioned, hey, you know, check out podcasts. There's just a plethora of information. It's almost a new Google, if you will. I find on my iPhone app, the podcast app, and I uh, searched, I think it was probably for something along the lines of real estate investing. And I came across this podcast called Get Rich Education with this guy, Keith Weinhold. So I gave episode one, a listen, and the content just was speaking with me at the time. At the time, I was really interested in personal finance and investing and just trying to expand my means and have something to strive towards. And the content at that time just was like exactly what I needed to hear. So I've been a fellow avid listener ever since, and it's uh, given me a lot of great content to uh, use as the foundation for my investing journey. Yeah, I really appreciate your listenership. I think that first episode spoke to a lot of us, kind of, there's so many of us out there when we complete our education, whether that was high school or college and beyond, and we start this J job, we just learn, gosh, is that really all that there is, sort of this 40-hour-a-week job where it's something I really sort of dread going to and I'm not passionate about, and yeah, if it says that I'm looking forward to the weekend, that doesn't say anything that's very good about how I'm spending my Monday through Friday, and that's most of my best waking hours on five of the seven days of the week. And then you sort of learn that you're following money. And what in the beginning, most people do follow money. They do start with the day job. And not a lot of people really end up discovering what you do, which is sort of what we talk about here at Get Rich Education, is rather than following money like you do at a day job, you really can implement a system so that sooner than later, you found a way to make money follow you. Yeah, that's a good point, Keith. And I think a lot of people in the system these days steer you towards getting a day job. And it's not the worst thing in the world, but everybody has to have a means to, you know, make a living. But you kind of have to have that mindset of what else is out there. Don't follow the money. Like you say, make money follow you and, you know, explore different opportunities. And there's lots of things out there rather than just working a nine to five for someone else. 
And I'm glad that there are a lot of people that are content to go ahead and follow money and workday jobs because I need someone to pick up my trash or supply my kitchen with coffee and on and on. But I just don't want to be one of them. I was one of them for long enough. So, well, just tell us a bit about like how you've taken sort of this mindset and this new way of thinking and transitioned that into some action in building your own portfolio. I mean, you're from one of those parts of the world, Western Oklahoma, where the numbers sort of make sense. So just tell us about some actionable stuff that you did to go ahead and build your portfolio and maybe even how this show helped reflect your action. Yeah, Keith. Well, I uh, spent a lot of time, you know, listening to your podcast and reading other material and reading books and surfing the web, finding lots of free content out there. And I did that for, you know, quite a while, maybe six plus months. And then finally, I decided it was time to pull the trigger and really do this thing for myself. And this thing I'm speaking of is investing in a, in income producing real estate. So I was still pretty nervous at this point, didn't know if this was really what I wanted to do. So I started out small, which maybe is not the best thing to do. But for me at the time, it worked well. So I bought a small single family home for $25,000. Wow. Maybe some of the listeners out there are thinking, yeah, just like that. Wow. And in Western Oklahoma, that's a thing. A $25,000 house exists. And surprisingly enough, it's not that bad. It's something that I personally wouldn't mind living in. And so I bought this for 20% down. It cost me $5,000 to get in this house. And I rented it out. And it was there that I had this aha moment when I got that first rent check. It was like a proof of concept. Like I'd done a lot of studying and reading and learning about this subject, but it wasn't until then that I was 100% sure this thing was going to work. So that was kind of like my turning point mentally with this. And I thought, hey, I can take this thing and do it again and again and just rinse and repeat and grow my portfolio that way. So that's what I've done. And here I am today. That is a major ta-da when you get that first rent income check and you start to learn that, yeah, passive income, that's something that really does exist. I really can produce income for myself with none of my own involvement, and I shouldn't feel bad or remorseful about that or like I'm taking advantage of anyone. I mean, how am I taking advantage of someone? I'm providing them with good housing. Yeah, definitely, Keith. And I think that's the uh, mentality you've got to take with it is you're doing good in the world and you're providing something someone needs. And you can be a good landlord and operate correctly, whereas other people out there don't necessarily do that. So you are bringing good and production into the society. Yeah. So you're growing your portfolio. You have properties in both western Oklahoma and then for those that aren't familiar with the geography, um, sort of that northern part of Texas, that northern panhandle in the Amarillo area. So what's it like to grow a portfolio there? And, and do you like single family homes? And can you get a good quality of tenant in that area with numbers that work with a small down payment? Yeah, definitely. All good questions, Keith. And one of the reasons I entered in those markets is, like I said, I'm from Oklahoma, so I knew the area. I understood the demographics and the local communities and things like that. So I felt comfortable investing there. I also had infrastructure. I knew people, had contacts with brokers and realtors and property managers and things like that. So I felt comfortable investing in those markets. But almost just as importantly is the point of entry was where I could afford to get started. Being a new to recent college graduate, I didn't have a ton of money to just go out and you know buy a bunch of turnkey properties. I had to kind of start from the ground up. So in terms of investing from out of state or at least rather far away, it's been an interesting uh, learning curve. The very first property I had, I just placed almost the very first tenants that came into my pool. And I quickly <laughs> learned, hey, screening tenants is important. So about three months into the very first lease, this tenants uh, decided they no longer wanted to live there. And they both left and just left a bunch of their stuff. So I had to go in, clean up all of that stuff, repair it, bring it back up to speed. And I thought, OK, next time I'm going to screen my tenants much better. And, and you know, it's like learning from those types of mistakes. If you're self-managing, that is one of the biggest early mistakes to take the first tenant that you think is qualified or just has enough for the down payment and the security deposit for the first month. And that's especially true when you work a full-time job, which you do, which I want to ask you more about in a moment. But when you do work that full-time job, too, and you have a lot less discretionary time and you're doing your own management and you're doing your own leasing, 
Number one, if that person has the money, well, that's money in your pocket today rather than next week. And then secondly, you've made the problem go away. That problem of being concerned that you might have to do more showings, you might have to deal with more tenants, you might have to deal with more screening. Well, all those problems go away if you do just go ahead and accept the first tenant that appears qualified, but that might still be the wrong thing, I think, just like you're telling us here, because that just doesn't work out for the long term. So, yeah, if you just think longer picture and defer that for a week or two until you find the right tenant, you might find a rent paying tenant that respects a property and stays two years. So it's totally worth taking the short term loss for the long term gain. Yeah, Keith, those were exactly my thoughts when I, you know, I was looking at these you know, applications. It was just like, hey, who's the first person that's borderline qualified by these criteria I didn't necessarily have? And I just thought, hey, this is the way to do it. And I've learned from those mistakes and I screened my tenants a little better and I haven't had any problems like that. <laughs> It's incredible how the disposition of tenants can change awfully quickly as soon as they get those keys to your unit in their hand. It's just incredible <laughs> what can happen. Yeah. Now, interestingly, I think just like a lot of our listeners, you have a full time job and you're beginning to build your real estate investing portfolio on the side. And I know that you're not involved with all the management because interestingly, your father, he sort of has a predisposition to be good at, at handyman things and management. So he's done a lot of that for you for the meantime. But you still got a full time job while you're trying to build your portfolio. And even if you're not your property manager on all your properties, you're still sort of the asset manager on some of those properties that others manage. So as far as the mindset of a person that has a full time job and they're starting to build up their passive income on the side, which is squarely where you're at and what you're doing, what are those sort of mindsets or strategies for people that are in that situation? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Keith. And a lot of people out there are in those similar positions where they're working a full time job and trying to invest on the side. And it can be difficult at times. Now, one of the things that drew me to investing was at this job, I always felt like there was a ceiling with KPIs and performance reviews. And they're just like, you know, step by step on getting a raise and advancing. And I just felt like there's always this ceiling. So outside of my day job and in the investing world, there really is no ceiling. Your limit, your success isn't really limited. And so that's what really drew to me about that. Yeah, you were right on kind of being an asset manager of these properties. While I'm still somewhat handling the day-to-day -day management of these properties, I do outsource a lot of things. I'll call a plumber or an electrician, you know, have them come out to the property. It's just myself making that call rather than the property manager. So right now, I kind of like to think of it as somewhat of a hybrid model that's working for me. And kind of that infrastructure I touched on earlier being in my home state of Oklahoma, some of that infrastructure are like, you know, my pseudo property manager at the time, my dad. So he helped me out with some of those things, you know, he's got a lot of contacts there that I can build upon. So yeah, that's kind of how it's worked for me up to this point. What else should real estate investors know? What other epiphanies did you have? Any other aha moments or just takeaways or things that you know now that you wish you would have known when you had started or even ways that you would have started differently? Yeah, so many, Keith, so many lessons to have been had. But I think the first thing that I would tell most people is just take that first step. And that first step could be in the form of just educating yourself, picking up a book, going to a RIA meeting. That's a real estate investing association club or, you know, these meetups. Just take that first step. It might be a small step. It might just be networking with a local investor, learning this information, or maybe that step's a little larger and you're just going to dive in and buy your first property. But whatever it is, just take action and learn as you go and be proactive in your approach to, you know, growing both yourself and your outside investments. So that would be my advice to the listener. Just take that first step. Yeah. And now you said earlier that you started small. Well, you know what? Most people don't get started at all. So I think a mantra of think big but start small actually isn't too bad because when you do make those early failures, those are great lessons. You're much less likely to make that mistake again. And if you start out with just one single family home as a rental, well, then your failure is probably going to be limited in its damage. Yeah, that was kind of my thought, Keith. That's where I was coming from. You know, like when these tenants moved out of this very first property, Fortunately, I could cover the mortgage and cover the repair cost in the short amount of time it took me to go in and re, you know, bring that place back up to speed. So, yeah, that was my thinking along the lines of start small, but always have this abundance mentality as you preach on GRE. 
So when you're screening tenants, is there any particular software that you use or anything that helps you go through your checks, like verifying their employment history, doing a court search, doing a criminal background check, doing credit search, any particular tools that you like with screening tenants that really help you? Yeah, nothing in particular, Keith. What I found is just doing a background check and a credit check really give you a good snapshot of someone's credibility. You want to know if they have a long rap sheet or just terrible credit with a history of not paying off their debts or you know bills. And so those two things, I feel, just give me a, an adequate enough snapshot for me to make a decision based on what I'm seeing on paper. Even if a tenant seems like a nice person and even if they have a good job, If they have a 520 credit score, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a bad tenant, but you need to look at it through the lens of like, well, now this person has nothing to protect, nothing to defend against. So if they go ahead and default, well, they didn't really have much to lose. What else do you think real estate investors need to know today? Or, you know, that might just be a compelling why for getting into real estate investing. Because, you know, on Get Rich Education since the beginning, I talk about the why just as much as I talk about the how. Because if you don't know why you're investing in real estate, then you really don't care how. Yeah. Well, one other thing, Keith, I think that maybe the listeners should realize is this mantra or idea of live where you want and invest where the numbers make sense. For me, I really wanted to implement this buy a duplex, triplex, or fourplex in my local market, live in one unit, and fix the other up as my very first property. That's the strategy I really tried to make happen, but it just didn't work in my local market, at least not where I was willing to live in one unit. So in those neighborhoods that I wanted to live, the just numbers didn't quite make sense. So I realized that that strategy wasn't going to work for me. And I moved on to still living in my market that I do, but investing outside of my market. So don't let that get you down. If you're in that position of just looking to get started, you might have to go outside of your market to get your very first deal. And I think it's important to bring up that you are from Oklahoma, but you are a resident of Houston, Texas, where you work in the engineering and the fire suppression business. So you are actually investing geographically outside your own market in a completely different state. And I think you're just talking about how the whole fourplex thing, living in one unit, owner occupied, running out the other three with an FHA three and a half percent down. You told me that you felt like that just didn't work in Houston. It's just location to the things I like to be around. So sure, I could move to far out in the suburbs and, you know, maybe find a place there. But it just I felt like at that point I was following money and not making money follow me like you've practiced and preached so much on GRE. I mean, I was trying to make both of these at this point opposing philosophies work and they just weren't both meshing together well. So. Yeah, they are some big picture ideas. Don't follow money, make money follow you and live where you want to live and invest where the numbers make sense. And a lot of people can nod their head all day and that sounds like it makes complete sense to them, but they totally don't go ahead and do anything about it. Well, you're doing things about it. You're building a portfolio. And interestingly, you have launched your own show. You have launched your own podcast and platform. So just tell us a bit about that before you go. Yeah, Keith. So like I mentioned, in 2014, I'd never heard of a podcast, and I felt like there was such a great medium to learn things through from Get Rich Education to a lot of different things out there beyond real estate investing, just personal finance and leadership. And, you know, just like anything you could find on a podcast or anything you could want to find is on a podcast. So I have since launched my own podcast called The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, where I, too, teach others how to get started investing in real estate in a space I particularly like, Keith, is multifamily. So that's a lot of the focus of the show. And that's kind of been my uh, most recent project is launching that podcast and uh, doing kind of a similar show to GRE. Any last things you think the listeners should know about? Hey, Keith, I think just get out there, take that first step, take action. And soon enough, you'll look back in a few years and you'll have a property or two or maybe 10 or 20 or hundreds. You never know. So, you know, just take that first step and take action. Everyday people are doing it, and Jacob's one of them. Yeah, I recommend checking out Jacob's show. Again, it's called The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom. Jacob Ayers, thanks so much for stopping by Get Rich Education. It's been pretty cool having you on the show, which was the first show you ever listened to in your life. Hey, so cool for me too, Keith. Thanks so much for having me on. So Jacob started with just a $5,000 down payment on a $25,000 property that he would actually live in himself. And some people that live in high-priced coastal markets actually have a pause when they consider buying an 
80K property in Memphis or a 130K property in St. Louis. Now, I look forward to doing this show for you every week here, but you know, next week's show is one that I've really been anticipating for quite a long time. It's about helping yourself while at the same time reaching out beyond yourself and leaving a legacy for your heirs all at the same time. It is such a unique real estate opportunity, and I can't wait to share it with you. Hey, thanks to today's guest, Jacob Ayers, and be sure to check him out. Until then, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Ranked by Forbes as one of the fastest-growing cities, Orlando, Florida has a big and diverse economy, yet still features affordable rental properties that cash flow. Our Boots on the Ground turnkey provider, Greg Bond, wrote a special report to help you discover the amazing market of Orlando. Request your free copy today. Visit GetRichEducation.com forward slash Orlando. That's GetRichEducation.com forward slash Orlando. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.